Here we are. Everybody's going back after a break. Maybe it was hectic. Maybe just the break in itself. Maybe spending too much time with your with your in laws has your clients like kind of losing their minds. We have all sorts of ways in which we find mothers at the beginning of the year. Some of them are just so relieved to find themselves back at work, which as Tori and I discuss is very normal to get back on a schedule. And Tori, I just want to stop for a second and and ask you why scheduling is, it, it's what is so important about it, both physiologically and psychologically? Right. So yeah, when we, when we go back to work, particularly after, you know, a few months off from, from parental leave, I mean, I think what you're talking about is kind of scheduling in your pumping and allowing time for that. Right. So yeah, some, part of me, not, you're right. Yes. Yeah. So some people, um, I think have the misconception that you need to time your pumping to match what the baby's sort of feeding schedule was. And I always reassure people that that's not necessary, That really what's most important is just regular emptying of the breasts and figuring out kind of what your magic number is. There's a great article by Nancy Moorbacher about your magic number, kind of how, how long can you go without emptying the breasts before it ha- starts to have an impact on your supply. So knowing what that is for you, for some people it's every three hours, maybe some people a little bit longer, but really scheduling in that time. And so depending on your job and everyone has different types of jobs, you know, there's desk jobs and there's jobs where you're moving around a lot or you, you know, you're, you're, you may not have as flexible of a schedule, but I think advocating for yourself and talking with your colleagues, your boss. So as um, an IBCLC, how do you then communicate? And I'm curious, and please fill in the chats here. How do you help somebody who's really looking for hard and fast answers, which is really where we find mothers today looking for, you know, a clear, clear, clear understanding? How do you help them to best find these these magic numbers when um, it takes a little bit of curiosity and experience of, of, of actually being that pumping mother to know that. How do you recommend everybody help people, um, everybody here, the lactation community, how do you recommend they teach that process? And can anybody here in our chat um, share with us how it is they've been able to, to get a client to a place of being comfortable, being uncomfortable until they find that number. So I think for my clients, you know, it's a little bit of trial and error and a, and a lot of just practice. So kind of figuring out your, your routine and it's not probably gonna, gonna gel perfectly on day one. So I think setting realistic expectations before you go back to work and knowing that, you know, it'll, it'll be a little period of time where you're trying to kind of figure out what the best routine is, you know, and if you have a daily meeting at 10 a.m., then maybe you need to think about putting, you know, a 1030 pumping on your schedule right following that meeting. So things like that, where you kind of get into a routine. We do have a class at the Breastfeeding Center. I'm sure there's classes all over the country about return to return to work, you know, where we kind of go over all of that stuff. And, and some of it is kind of nitty gritty facts and like logistics, because there's the issue of milk storage, transporting milk, um, where you're going to be pumping. Like, is there a pumping room? Is it on your floor? Do they have a refrigerator? All the equipment that's needed is sort of, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to figure that stuff out. Then there's the emotional side, right? That I think we'll talk about a little bit. Um, Well, you know, I want to interrupt for one second. Because of the new laws, because of the pump law, a lot of these variables that we're so used to asking our clients to hunt down, basically, um, we, we, we tell them to please find from your peers. We tell them to HR isn't always the best resource. And I say that not to put HR down, but just because, you know, we've always, we've always trained women to say, to find that peer, not just for support, but also for the inside skinny. There's always inside line. Kind of the good news is part of that work will now be done for us because it's no longer possible to be told to go into a bathroom and or there's no room with a lock could you just wedge that chair underneath so that's part of the good news I guess right there's less there's less tactical yeah all of that information should be a little more accessible to you and so a little easier to figure out hopefully and hopefully better you know we're just these laws are achieving better scenarios for people in the workplace Right. But let's talk, let's go back to the the emotional side of it, because the emotional stuff, 
um, that there is legislation. Though I should stop and say the new law. Donna's so good here. Donna has has obviously um, spent as much time um, just immersed in this law as I have. In terms of litigation or suing, it's much easier to to actually force your employer into a situation. They get like it's one warning and then you're you're off. To, to figuring it out a different way. But back to this idea of, we we're not talking about legislation, we were talking about um, the fact that legislation itself gets us part of the way there, but really the psychological side of it. And that, Tori, is, is that possibly why you started the Back to Work and Breastfeeding class? That's a big part of it. And I'm sure, you know, all of you out there who have helped clients with this transition know the... Um, kind of roller coaster that it can feel like, right? Because it's such a mix of emotions. On the one hand, probably you're looking forward to going back and seeing your colleagues and talking to adults and getting dressed in real clothes and having a break from that daily grind of having a young baby in the house. And then there's the sort of heartache and sadness and bittersweet, I'm leaving my baby, I won't be feeding or holding my baby all day. And if you've been doing that nonstop for two, three, four months, um, that can be really, really sad. And so it's definitely a mix of emotions. There's anxiety, there's guilt, there's sadness, and then there's excitement as well. So as lactation consultants, of course, I mean, most of us are not uh, therapists, but to come out and, and give our clients um, the emotional support that they need when they're going back to work as well. And so I do believe the idea of having a peer group at work, in addition to the support of your lactation, whether it be the consultant or the IBCLC that you're working with, it's so essential. And that's not going to go away. And I think that is so, so critical um, that we recognize that, yes, this law is here, but the more emotional side that is not going away. Sure, exactly. Yeah, I think this is this is important. And this is something that you and I've discussed over and again, you share that your old assumptions about where mother is headed with her pumping have shifted. Like you said, you don't assume they're going to an office, you don't assume anything anymore, because there's so many different iterations of what back to work looks like. Is it flux time? Is it, you know, less travel? Is it more travel? Like, because you can't assume as much as you used to, how does that change the job of her IBCLC and and whomever is involved with her lactation support with so many variables, I guess, is what I want to say. Yeah, I think it's important for us as lactation consultants to um, really listen to our clients' individual needs in whatever their job may be. And that, you know, I, I probably wrongly used to assume before COVID, you know, that and in, in the D.C. area that everyone is going back to sort of some office setting, yeah. which is silly because I never I've never worked in an office myself and a lot of people don't. And now so many people are working from home. So many people are working hybrid and there are just different jobs out there. There's teachers, there's nurses, there's active duty military. There's all these different factors that play into what your work life looks like. So I think it's really important as lactation consultants to not do any kind of one size fits all. This is how it's done, but to really listen to our clients' individual needs and then troubleshoot and work with them on how to achieve their goals once they're back to work. And I, I think about this a lot with flex time. You know, flex time was was nowhere. I'm looking at everybody who's here. There are a lot of very seasoned women here. And by that, I mean experienced, um, not anything else. Um, I bet none of us could really imagine that we would be helping a new mother prepare for flex time or even negotiating what flex time is best for her. And in terms of milk supply, I mean, I don't know if anybody here feels like they figured out, you know, the best strategy for flex time and pumping. Okay, so um, there's a story you told me recently, and I and I wanted to ask it again. It was a recent client of yours who was a journalist, and I, I really think it, it um, brings to life the different places and times and requirements of... Um, different ways we work, right? We don't all work in offices. We don't all have the luxury of closing our own office door um, and putting a lock on it. We don't all have that. I, I, I think the story you told me was so important just in terms of showing like, the range of places and conditions under which a woman was expected to pump. So could you set that up and, and share this? Um, again, I just think it's very enlightening. Yeah, so I thought this was a really interesting um, case as well, because well, here in the DC area, you know, I see clients with lots of unique jobs, I'm sure all over the place we do. 
Um, but this person in particular was uh, a journalist with the White House press pool. And so she would she, she would need to follow the president wherever he was going and cover speeches. And they have people, they take turns. So it's not like she was on all the time. And so she's also working a desk job because she's a journalist and she's also hybrid. So sometimes she's working from home. So she has kind of three different things like going and following the president, being at the White House, also traveling if he's overseas or wherever, working from home and working at the office. And so she was just getting a little nervous about how to manage all that with her with her pumping life. And so uh, and there's a significant amount of downtime when you are in the press pool, because there's a there's a lot of waiting around, you know, the, there's scheduled speeches and stuff, but they all get there early. They're at the White House. They're sitting around They're They're waiting. So how is she going to manage all of this? Um, let me just interrupt and say for anybody who's curious, there is a pumping room right off the right off the press. Right there off is the press. a pumping room at the White House. Yes. Yeah. I talked to interestingly, I talked to a friend whose kids are older, like mine, teenagers, and she's been doing this for years. And she said there was not back in the day. Yeah, there was she not. in a bathroom. Yeah. At the White House. So yes, improvements. Um, so, so this client and I, we talked through the ways that she would try to anticipate her pumping needs and to seek out the places, you know, and have the right equipment with her. Um, and, and, you know, I, I suggested that she talk with other moms in her similar situation, you know, people that have, that have also pumped um, and, and been in that situation and get their advice. But it's just, I thought it was a really interesting example of how unique a job can be, that it can be kind of a combination of many different things and being in different places. Um, and that it's doable, you know, it's doable. It just requires some additional planning um, and anticipating what your needs might be. And maybe going and scoping it out ahead of time and doing a dry run and seeing, you know, how that's going to look. But I think, you know, as lactation consultants, I think we need to consider all of our clients' unique needs um, and just really listen to their concerns about going back to work because it's just not one size fits all. No, it's not. That is a very, um, very natural um, introduction to something that I think um, everybody's got a way to do, but I would love to hear how it is you advise your clients. How do you best advise them on that? Get, you mentioned dry run. I know that's part of, of what you suggest. How is it you advise a client to make her way back to being a pumping mother in the workplace? As I like to say, you never come back to work as the same person you left as. You don't. You, you, um, you left as somebody who had 100% of your life to yourself to use as you wanted. And that shifts, that changes, as does your ability to be as masterful as you once were. Um, I, I often refer to it as being, you know, um, <laughs> you know, like back, on your flat on your back at the bottom of a learning curve, because that's kind of where you find yourself. But Tori, you've got some really um, great insights and ways to help women find their way back, feeling a little bit more confident than just showing up. So um, I wonder if you wouldn't share that with everyone. Sure. Um, I always suggest that people do a, an office visit uh, at least a, a couple weeks before they're actually going back to the office and bring the baby with you and sort of scope out the scene. Some co-workers are more su more supportive than others, right? But I think having the baby along with you kind of reminds them what you've been doing for the past few months. That you've been <laughs> and cute doesn't hurt. Cute never hurts. Cute never hurts. They want to see the baby. You want to check out you know, the whole lactation, if there's a lactation room where the milk storage happens, can you lock your door? Do you have a private place? All of those things. And so I always recommend that. Another helpful tip that I really like is to not go back to work on a Monday. To yeah. start on the Thursday, if you can, <laughs> Wednesday, whatever, midweek, late week, because having a shorter week and then having the weekend again, assuming again that you work a Monday through Friday type of job, you're not you're not away for five days in a row and you can kind of ease in. And then depending on your, your childcare situation, certainly doing some dry runs with daycare is helpful too. Getting that set up so that maybe you drop the baby and go to the grocery store, or you drop the baby and, you know, go sit, or, sit around and do nothing for a couple hours so that you can get accustomed to what that drop off looks like and, and get baby used to a new care provider in a smaller, smaller chunks rather than just a full day. If you can, if you can ease into work doing half days, 
for the first week. That's great too. But even bigger than that are some of the most basic things. So an employer who thinks that they are being absolutely wonderful by putting in a hospital grade pump, what your client may not know are things like, Tori. Like you need to get the parts that work with that pump right? And yeah, so that's another, another thing you'll want to figure out. And I always tell my clients, you know, when you're going to work and scoping out the situation, or you're talking to another mom and and trying to figure all that out, what pump, if anything, if they have a hospital grade pump, which pump is it? And what uh, accessory kit do you need to go with that? And sadly, even if you have the same brand at home, it's not necessarily the same. It's not compatible with the hospital grade pump. So that may be a situation where maybe you have a Spectra pump at home. They have a Medela Symphony at your office. You're going to have to have those parts and maybe you can leave them at the office, but you'll have to have that whole kit of parts and getting the right flange fit and all of that for that particular pump. And there's also the qu- the question of, you know, we used to tell, well, we still tell mothers to please practice, right? You, you can't just like open that box the day before <laughs> you go to work. That's a bad idea, just generally speaking. Question is, you know, what are, what are you advising these days? Are you advising that a person still have two pumps insurance wise? I mean, it's not difficult if you know, if you save a little bit of money, not difficult to have two pumps. Are you advising them to do that versus try to work with two very different systems? What's what's the best advice and, and what are the best outcomes? How can you um, help to guide everybody here today in, in helping their clients make these decisions? So again, not one size fits all. It kind of depends on your situation. How much of a pumper are you regularly? Do you pump a lot on the weekends? Do you pump even when you're with your baby? I would say if you are, then you either need to be can your pump back and forth from the office or have an office pump and a work pump. Many people can get away with just having a pump and leaving it at the office or you you know using an office pump because they don't pump when they're with their baby, they're just breastfeeding. So it kind of depends on on the individual situation. Some people are fine with just carrying a pump back and forth that works well for them. I, I will say that they're the the uh, tools of the trade are a little bit better. I've I've noticed, like for example, um, the line of diaper bags that um, Sarah Wells that that are made for pumps. I mean, her attention to detail and you know, including the size of the pump and which pump is it, and all of all of the ability to keep things cool. It's a far cry from what we used to look at with yeah. these monstrous cases. I mean, I, I'll give. Well, there's this cool thing now. I wish I could think of the name of it. Maybe some, maybe someone on here can, uh, knows, but um, one of my colleagues has been using this. It's like a chiller kind of cooler thing for breast. They're milk. amazing. They are suje. Will you put them up? They're called um, kill something. Yeah, pippy sips. Oh, that's not the one I'm thinking of. Maybe okay. that's similar. It is well, like I mean, it's kind of like your you know yeah. your water bottle, yeah. but. Uh, ch- really cold, chilling, and then you just sort of pour yeah. all the milk together and take it home. That's what Pippi Sips is. I don't know the name okay. of the other one, but right, the ease of the ease of. Anyway, yeah, look I it up. It, I'll put it. I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, uh, please. But yeah, there's so many so much- great. Right, that create ease of use, and I think that's um, that's super important. And yeah, I mean, we're not here pitching products; we're just sharing what we know. So please, I love please. a good hack, though. Anything that makes your life easier, right? So one of the other um, hacks that you have that I love has to do with the extra pumping on the weekends. You want to touch on that a little bit? I'm sure we're all familiar with the client who's just kind of barely keeping up, you know, or maybe not quite keeping up with um, their baby's demands when it comes to going back to work. And, you know, they have to send, let's say 14 ounces to daycare and they're just at 14 or maybe they're at 12. Um, So making up a little bit of the difference on the weekends, if, you know, Perhaps you do two pump sessions, you know, one on Saturday, one on Sunday, and maybe that gives you an extra six ounces, which is an extra ounce per day for the work week. Um, So, you know, nobody loves pumping. And of course, you know, you can always patch in formula as needed. But for people who are really, really dedicated to wanting to give, um, you know, expressed breast milk, and they're kind of just not quite keeping up um, at the office, And then there's, you know, you can always do a pump session before you go to bed at night um, because it's not, it's not realistic for everyone to get enough milk in that eight hour work day or 10 hour work day um, for, for the baby for the whole day. So sometimes, sometimes it makes sense to make up the difference at other times. Ask questions, 
please also know this. Your ideas for topics are always, always welcome. Your friends and associates are always welcome. Just send, send us their name and we will invite them for next time. We are trying to expand this. The more voices, the more opinions, the more people who care passionately about helping mothers to find their success, however they define it, the better. Uh, let me put in, uh, Julia, it looks like we have a question from Daniel in the chat. Um, Daniel says, Thoughts on building a stash versus pumping the day before for the uh, for use for the following day? Yeah, so that's a good question. I'm, I mean, I can tackle that. Um, so many people, I think, are um, influenced by social media and the sort of stash, you know, that they think that that is that having a freezer filled with milk is sort of necessary to go back to work. And we all know that's not really true. Um, so I don't think it's really one or the other. You know, most people are pumping on Monday what they're sending with the baby on Tuesday. That's kind of what I think of the typical pumping working parent to be doing. That said, a lot of people do have a stash. I think if it comes naturally to you or you have an abundant milk supply, um, you may have a bit of a stash and then you work your way through that. But I people get nervous about digging into their stash or I, I, I don't want to use that. It's like, that's what it's there for, right? You're back to work. Maybe, you know, you're needing to pull a little bit from that. If you have a stash, pull from that a little bit here and there if you're not quite you know pumping enough at work or whatever so i always remind my clients that you do not need a freezer full of milk to go back to work you need enough milk for day one maybe with a little bit of a buffer and that you'll be pumping when you're away from the baby so i'd love to hear what everyone else thinks on on that or what you're just saying my you know my new best friend donna um she addresses and what i think is very very real it has to do with stress and anxiety. Um, if this is something that states that, and I think Devin is is um, touching on the same thing, sort of you don't know what you don't know, and certainly as a first-time parent, you really don't know what you don't know. So I'm, I'm not going to go physiological. Um, I'm going to go more psychological. I think that if you've lowered somebody's stress, you've done something quite good. I know that every time... It's a little peace of mind to have some, yeah. someone who doesn't have a stash can feel very inadequate or like some kind of failure. So I always just remind people it's okay if you don't have a stash. I actually have a question around that. Like, I, I, you know, since we're, we're talking about like back to work and like, you know, we're talking about like building milk stashes and like, you know, pumping and making sure that, um, you know, you have that checklist when you're going back to work about the things that you'll need as far as like breastfeeding is concerned. But one of the things that people don't really talk about is sleep, right? And like how their schedules are now going to change. Um, now, in addition to you know, them having to stay awake for the baby, like there's more because there's like, now you have to go to work and there's that, there's that extra bit of stress from, from work, right? Like, have you sort of had those questions from your clients about like how to deal with that? Or like, is that something that they don't expect until they're actually like experiencing it? Like what is, what is sort of that experience been? It's hard because when people go back to work, they're expected to be sort of a functioning adult at, at the office or at their, you know, at their job. And they probably haven't gotten a great night's sleep because babies we all know who are three months old, four months old are still probably waking multiple times at night to eat. So um, hopefully by that time they've gotten in a bit of a rhythm where it's not like they're awake for many hours at night and it's a quick feed and back to sleep. Um, and then the other, <laughs> the other interesting thing is that sometimes babies um, start waking more frequently when, when mom goes back to work, um, simply because they're not together during the day. Uh, so it can, it can be extremely challenging. I wish I had some magic answer <laughs> or solution to that, but a lot of people here are reminding us and thank you, um, that there are postpartum doulas and, um, they're very, they're very important because they offer similar services. So, um, I, I guess we're, we're going to close on that, that we, um, we know that there are so many topics to cover, but the idea of how is it you're, you're managing, um, how is it you're helping your clients to manage back to work and all these other transitions? Um, it's it's complicated stuff, and we are so grateful to have this community, um, this lactation community, to help um, both Lilo as a brand offer this support through you to these women. Um, but we're grateful also for your feedback. I hope you'll keep joining us. Tell us what you want to talk about. Tell us what's essential. Tell us your hacks. Um, now we're all going to send frozen meals. I like that one too. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. I yeah, mean, absolutely. There's so many ways to care for women. I thank you. I know Lilu Lee, Lee um, thanks you for being here.